Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode here on Six and Bones with your ghost host, Chelsea and Ten. Hi, Ten. How are you? It is getting into spooky season. I am loving the crisp feeling of the air. The serotonin is back in me. Like, I feel like I am, like, being resurrected. Like, I am once again coming alive from beyond the grave. Like, I'm- I agree. I'm, I, I don't know what it is about this September crisp in the air, but this, this is the serotonin I've been chasing all year long. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm the same way, even though it's 90 degrees out today to have my AC on, I am- <laughs> I patiently await for the cold weather, but the mornings like last week, especially have been super cold and I love it. Like when I could just open my window and just catch a breeze when I'm sleeping. Oh, yeah. Or, um, I've also been keeping like on YouTube, you can like have like, um, haunted mansion music, like spooky lo-fi music. And as I'm like doing my chores or playing video games or reading, I keep spooky music on in the back. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. This is, this is the witch's Christmas. It is. I've been slowly but surely like dabbling into like my Halloween playlist, Mm -hmm. but like I'll only listen to it for like a little bit and then I'll be like, okay, I have to go back to like my normal playlist just to like tease myself and be like, oh, so close to Halloween. I can't wait. Yeah. And next week's episode, actually, we're going to be diving into like our fall bucket list and our like movie recommendations for the fall. Ted and I have been putting together like separately our own bucket list because I feel like last year I didn't accomplish the things I wanted to do. So at least if I have some sort of guideline and list, I'm like, okay, I want to start checking things off of like, I did this, I did this, like really to maximize fall, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I said this last year, I feel like I was rushed last year, like last fall, like all of a sudden it was the beginning of September and then October 31st. Like there was no in between. It goes by really fast. Yeah. Absolutely insane. But I'm fighting off a little, little bit of a cold for those listeners out there who say, why does 10 sound like snuffleupagus? Well, (laughs) Kevin got me sick. (laughs) Down with Kevin, burn him at the stake. No, I'm just kidding. I got a weird question before we continue. Yes. What is your opinion? Because I almost (laughs) threw Kevin out of the house last night for offering me this. What is your opinion on the throat sprays that like numb your throat? No, no. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Thank you. Okay. Why would I ever want that? Unless like I had tonsillitis a long time ago. I actually had to get fun fact, how to get my tonsils removed at 21, (laughs) which is like the worst thing you can do. as an adult, like that's really old. It was old. So my, my tonsils were so bad. They had to be removed. I kept getting strep. Anyway, I'll spare you the details. It was gross. Um, and I did it over like, I think Christmas break when I was in college, worst surgery I've ever had. I didn't recover for like six months. I couldn't eat anything. Throat was on fire. That's the only reason I can see a throat numbing spray. I, the way I looked at him, I was like, why would, why? And he followed up with, oh, I've never used it. But like, I was ready to fight him on why would you offer me this? It is the weirdest sensation, the weirdest feeling. I think I'd rather rather swallow bees, to be completely honest. (laughs) No, no, that's a crazy thing to offer somebody. This is the roast of Kevin. (laughs) What are you doing? I've never tried it, but you should you should have this like numbing throat spray so you can't feel water when you drink it. Like that would absolutely send me into the oblivion. Nah, I think I'll swallow up a beehive. I don't know. Yeah. No, I'm good. I'll just rip my throat out. I, I'd rather that. <laughs> Thank so, you. So yeah, that, that's where I was. And I was like, last night, I was like, you know what? I got to ask Chelsea this. And I'm going to save it for live for the podcast. Because no way. I don't, I don't know if we could still be friends with the throat spray, you know? No, no, no. That's a deal breaker in a friendship. You want to have a friend? Ask them this question. Um, Maybe we'll put it as a poll or something. <laughs> <laughs> Do you use throat spray? People are going to come to our podcast and be like, what are they talking about? throat spray and Halloween man (laughs) yeah they go hand in hand anyway speaking of Halloween we are launching our Halloween collection this week the first part of it so if you're new here hi we're Chelsea and 10 we also own a metaphysical store called sticks and bones um where we can make everything we have all of the fun unique spooky things um we have so much fun stuff coming out for October I can't even every week we're like kind of dropping something new oh yeah we have been busting our oh little bee butts into making sure that this one is the best yet. We were reflecting a little bit ago and was like, how are we going to up last year's? And then we realized we, our collection last year was not big at all. 
<laughs> I know. I know. We said this last time how it was only like eight pieces and we were like, oh. So now, now you guys, we cannot wait to show you all of the candles, the oils. It is pristine. We have all of the fun things and trinkets because you know, Chelsea yes. and I love some good trinkets. So let me, let me give you the, get your, your pen and paper or your notes app. I'm not kidding. Mystery yeah. boxes are launching this week, this Friday, September 15th at 12 PM Eastern time. They come with a mini channeled reading from me and 10. So we create, you get any of the Halloween products before they even launch. We have candles. We have three candles. I'm going to tell you what they are. We have yeah. the haunted mansion house blessing candle, which is absolutely insane like insane looking. We have the Madame Leota, which is for divination and fortune telling. So if you're a haunted mansion person or anyone that's like spooky things, the candles came out incredible. They look just like a ghost would. Um, and if you don't know Madame Leota, look her up. She's amazing. And then we also have a pumpkin trick or treat, like inner child candle for bringing in like the fun of Halloween when you're an adult. Um, yes. I've been trialing the roller that I made for that. Let me tell you something. I've been feeling like a kid in a candy store. I'm not kidding. Like nostalgia, wanting to do all the childish things. So if you're like an adult that doesn't celebrate Halloween or is like, oh, you need, you need it. You need the, you need the candle. You need the roller. You need everything. So you, you need it all. So set your alarms, gird your loins because we are only doing one drop of mystery boxes, one drop. And we hand select everything for you based on your reading. So if you get like an inner child message, like you'll obviously know what candle you need and it comes handwritten. We hand stamp them. Um, and you get a ton of our Halloween stuff and anything that we sell in the store that we find will fit your needs up to $200. And yes, we are offering the mystery boxes this year to 300 and they get something special. So, oh yeah, you guys there. get a little extra spooky. Yeah, but the theme that this year is Haunted Mansion and um, inner child fun for Halloween. We have yes. a lot of other crazy things coming to the store. We have a tea leaf reading fortune telling cup that comes with an instructional guide. We have ghosts and pumpkins and just all the fun things. We have mugs. We have beanies. Spoons. Spoons. <laughs> Pumpkin spoons. Also, um, the launch day of the full Halloween collection is September 21st. Yes. So it's coming right after. So if you don't snag a mystery box, um, the full collection will be launched, but the mystery boxes are fun. Cause you just don't know what you're going to get. So treat yourself. Exactly. Plus you guys might get some more exclusive. Oh goodness. yes. The exclusive Drop. exclusive, the most exclusive of exclusivities. <laughs> so I'll give like a little, I'm not going to say what it is, but we These are the people. <laughs> we are coming out with a line in the store that is a little bit more taboo and advanced. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to share one of the things just to get Ooh. you an idea. Which one? Which one are you doing? Okay. They're all so good. <laughs> so we are in, in light of today's episode, I'll share the one that's called the Inferno. We have this product called the Inferno and it is spelled for receiving forbidden knowledge and ambition. It really has like a Slytherin vibe, but it also reminds us of Lucifer, the fallen angel who teaches forbidden knowledge and is a God of liberation and knowledge himself. So it's really inspired by him and the infernal. Yes. Think of Dante's infernal. That's what and, it's based off of. And you know how every layer is just something deeper and you have to kind of go through hell to find out something deeper, darker, the restricted section, if you will. Yes, but the 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 product doesn't make you go through hell. I just want to no, 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 no. of the inferno, <laughs> but it is like for those of you that want more knowledge on things. Yes. So we spelled it for that. And we have another few things that are along those lines. We have a huge lineup of these like more advanced type magical things in our store that Ken and I do <laughs> actually practice. We just, you know, we don't flaunt it online. Yes. I always say a witch that has power never has to say they have power. They simply just do. Yeah. I'd rather move in silence and kind of be like the questionable one of like, who is she? The what townspeople, are they doing over there? The townspeople are making rumors and they think it's just like this grave hag. And it's just me and Chelsea walking behind them. Like, damn, who are they talking about? <laughs> yeah. A little piece of advice for people that have to scream from the rooftop that they are this great all seeing witch that knows everything. I bet you they know nothing at all. Real people that practice move in silence because the occult was always practiced in secrecy and silence. So 
you know, we don't need to be sharing everything that we do, but you know, we'll be dabbling a little bit of the dark arts in the store and we're very excited to bring it to you. So for those of you that are like, I want it's coming. You got it. You asked, we got, (laughs) you asked for it. It's coming. I don't think anybody asked for it. We're just like, you know what? You know what you need? This. You need this. (laughs) Apple? Like that's how I feel like we are. You asked for this? What? Spicy. (laughs) Did you ask for this? Oh, here you go. Here's the spicy thing. Come on. Here you go. I think you need this. Um, But for those of you that really want to change up your practice and amp it up, we got you. Because, yeah, we do sell a lot of, like, very beginner items in our store. Um, And also, this is a reminder, too, we do have store consultations open. So if you have a question about a product, and product only, please. They're not readings. We don't consult you on life. If you come to us and you book with us, um, and you have a product in mind in the metaphysical store, if you're like deciding between two things or you need an explanation, you can always book a consultation. We have them usually every Monday and Friday. Um, if you go to book a reading with us, you can see it's the first thing, the store consultation. So Ten and I will meet with you and we can show you the product and explain a little bit more in person. So we have a ton of new stuff coming out. So if you have questions, ask them, you can always email us. Um, that yeah. works. We don't check our Instagram DM. So don't oh, no. email us anything there. <laughs> No, no. A little housekeeping. That's... My DMs are a dumpster fire. Ah, uh, yeah. Unless it's Chelsea, my sister, or Kevin, when I'm sending like cat memes. Uh yeah, my my DMs are off. <laughs> yeah. So email us. You can check that out in our the links in our bios on our social platforms. But shall we dive into today, Ten? What do you think? Oh, you guys thought, you know, trying to trace and tackle Hecate was hard and full of red string. Well. I raise you one bigger with Lucifer. Right. So today's episode, like Ten just said, we are talking about Lucifer. And for those of you probably clutching your pearls and being like, what are you guys <laughs> talking about? Um, Hear us out for a second, because here at Sticks and Bones, we are very open minded. We are looking at the hard hitting facts. We're not just looking at what someone is telling us is the truth. Um, mm-hmm. Lucifer is also a God of truth. So this episode definitely is in honor of him today. Um, knowledge and liberation so we want to talk about lucifer and how he actually does predate christianity oh 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 god where to begin (laughs) where to begin so i want to start this episode with it all starts with a mistranslation about an empire collapsing and this is how the being lucifer was born honestly out of prophetic destruction like, I can't think of a better kind of, like, opener. Like, if I had a mythology based on me, I, I think I would want that, too, you know? I would, too. And we're going to be tracing him from um, different time periods, points in time. We mm-hmm. There's probably more, to be honest with you. There's so much to know about the being Lucifer. And does he even predate what we're saying now? I have no idea. Um, probably. <laughs> probably does. And his name wasn't always Lucifer. So that is definitely, um yes that's how we best know him as and that's what we best know his mythology in modern day but we're tracing him all the way from 800 bc to modern day yeah so here we go there's gonna be a lot of like jumps around so so bear with us because bear with us it all makes sense otherwise you know this is gonna be an hour podcast but this is not gonna be you know titanic avatar 2 we're not going for james cameron kind of movie tactics here no we'll come back and revisit this but um lucifer now the biggest thing that comes from lucifer is the mistranslation of it all so Mm -hmm. lucifer does not start as lucifer rather he starts with the name morning star so if we are going to start with biblical texts abrahamic texts um open up your bibles everybody he's going to be in isaiah and isaiah 14 12 is going to be probably the most quoted you know prose where it says quote how you have fallen from heaven a morning star son of the dawn Mm -hmm. but just that he is referenced as the morning star done and with isaiah scholars believe that the book of isaiah was written during the 8th century bce and in biblical scholarship this is going to be a proto isaiah for chapters 1 through 39 so historically why does this matter for us today historically this takes place canonically before the assyrian invasion of the kingdom of judah 
which occurs in about 702 BC. And this is way before the fall of the first temple and the Babylonian exile in 586 BC. So we're coming multiple centuries before this. And this portion, Isaiah 14, is going to be prophetic warnings of a foreign invasion. That is really the gist of it. And it's really interesting because if we continue down further in Isaiah 14, it really goes on to talk about an epithet of the Assyrian king. Mm -hmm. So not only is this not Lucifer, but this is kind of just a title of an emperor at this one time, this king right now. So in Greek, we have the word hysphoros, which is bringer of light. In Latin, it could be Lucifer, again, still meaning meaning light bringer. Mm -hmm. And in Hebrew, we have uh, heleo, which is shining one. And in this passage, it is going to be in reference to Nebuchadnezzar, who in the larger portion is going to challenge the Jewish god Yahweh to make his empire and his gods bigger than his. He is basically challenging the divinities who guard and protect the kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem at this time. Because he's saying, my gods and myself, we are better than you. So Isaiah is basically writing this king, this foreign king is going to come in who thinks he shines so bright. And he actually, because of his pride, because of his hubris, he's going to fall. And that is exactly what happens. So it's very, very crazy because, you know, as we move forward, we're going to jump about 700 years into the Roman period. We get more writings of Lucifer being a celestial being. Like he's still not this demon king of hell as we see him today. At this point in time with um, Cicero, he is writing in 45 BC that Venus is the lowest of the five wandering stars and is nearest to the earth, which is cause called Phosphoro in Greek, Lucifer in Latin. And when it joins the sun and when it follows a sparrow. So Cicero is writing about astrological events occurring, just normal every day to day kind of things. Then we have Ovid in the first century saying that he is the son of Aurora, who is the goddess of dawn. And the stars are shepherded by Lucifer, who is the morning star. And again, this is first century CE. We have Pliny the Elder also writing that this star, when it advances and rises before the dawn itself, it almost kind of marks dawn. It receives the name Lucifer as being another sun to bring in the dawn. So still first century BC to CE, celestial being he's just doing his duty as almost announcing the rising sun and then this is interesting because the book of revelation 10 10 copy first sorry i have a few (laughs) comments you're just like i'm like hold on i'm just blacking out man i know i know hold on okay so for those of you listening we still have antenna said no mention of lucifer even being an archangel or a god or a demon for that matter he is just showing up as a celestial being And I just want to make that very clear of like, he wasn't even viewed as an archangel at this point. None whatsoever. He's not, he doesn't even have a big role or status in the Greco-Roman period. He's not a God. There's not mythology around him. We looked high and low. I looked high and low today. I'm like, I see nothing. I I would have come, we would have come across this, you know, in our study with Hellenism, Lucifer would have been super present. Um, And I want to make that clear because as we continue going, we do reach a point where there is a tie with Lucifer and Diana. Yes. And I want to make this very clear when we get there that that mythology is incorrect. Um, It's an incorrect. The whole thing's incorrect. We will get there and uh, we will touch Christianity of when he turns into an archangel and why. But just pointing out the facts of he's not even that big in the Greco-Roman period. So what are we saying that he is the devil and Satan and all these things? Yes, because how all of these philosophers poets, authors, how they are describing Lucifer. Lucifer is just almost an event, a daily event that would Mm -hmm. occur in the sky. Like it's just naturally occurring much as the sun sets and the sun rises. 
the morning star comes up and, you know, announces the day and how we are going from a celestial event to <laughs> lore about a king of hell is absolutely probably the slipperiest of all slopes that I've ever seen. I know. And I don't even think we've caught everything in our research no. because we had to stop at some point and be like, you know what? I can't oh, the down rabbit, this rabbit hole. hole because Lucifer has evolved into so much more today, which I will talk about um, demonolatry at mm-hmm. the end, but it's just crazy. And we are on Patreon in December going to talk about for Patreon exclusive. Did Lucifer lead the three wise men to Jesus because of his ties <laughs> to Venus? Well, that, that kind of brings up my next aspect that I was asking myself and I I saw in a a reference scholars too are posing these questions of how does the morning star, which is astrologically the planet Venus, when and how does this become male? Because Venus is usually presented female. Of course, she is the, the Roman goddess of beauty. Like she is this very feminine icon. So where does this kind of go from female goddess star to male demon king and you know further than that how does venus as a planet become associated with pride it's absolutely insane i did read it's because it burns brightest in the sky and it even defies like dawn itself and when we get to christianity and i will i will be talking about christianity with lucifer (laughs) that is a theory as to why the early Christian fathers wrote him the way that they did. Yeah. And one last kind of clog I'm going to throw in the wheel before you take over with Christianity and the early church fathers is the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. The book of Revelation comes out or is believed to have been written during the first century. I believe it's like 92 CE plus or minus a decade. And in this, there is a section of Revelation 12, 7, 9 through 9 talks about the archangel michael we know him very well michael and his angels are fighting against a dragon and all of a sudden this adversary this lucifer figure becomes a dragon and in this section it states that the dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan so by first century ce when the book of revelation is being written by early church fathers they are already kind of making their own trinity of Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. And they all from that point on become interchangeable, Mm -hmm. but also separate. So yeah, so this leads me into Christianity. So (laughs) it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. So I'm not going to be touching a huge portion of Christianity because I think it's just important to focus on the story of Lucifer and his fall and where that comes from. At a later time, I would love to talk about the devil and the origins of the concept of the devil. Yes. Yes. But I think at this point in time, we do need to define what Satan, Satan actually means. Because if you look at Satan, some people believe in Satan as an actual figure, but Mm -hmm. some people believe that Satan is just anyone that opposes God. And Satan literally means adversary. Yes. So one who opposes. So it's someone that doesn't agree with Yahweh and opposes him. So any of us can be a Satan. You know what I mean? So I got a question. Now, is Satan specific of going against Yahweh or, you know, who who is the adversary to who? Right. So it depends on the definition and where you're finding it. There's there's multiple different definitions of Satan, some being really specific as opposing God and some just being an opposing force. An adversary, I mean, if you will. If it's just an adversary to something, like then I, I would say that we have all been adversaries against something in our own lives. Like, damn. Right. But when you're talking about Christianity and you are opposing what God is saying, right? You're yeah. we're, we would all kind of be looked at as a Satan. And and I'm I'm not trying to step on anyone's belief here. Um, I understand that in Christianity, good and evil exists. I'm just trying oh. to understand where these words are coming from these stories and what they actually mean um because i do study italian folk practice and evil and lucifer is definitely part of it you know what i mean that's that's was the belief of my own ancestors but um i think it's okay to adopt a belief and understand that there are some things that you just don't agree with 
because yeah. they come from somewhere else or they were mistranslations. And we always talk about Judaism, like how they never believed in hell. And we talk about they that don't. multiple times on the podcast of that's just my belief where I don't believe there is a hell because those that were worshiping Yahweh before Christianity even came around, didn't believe in hell. So why is there one now? Correct. And in the Torah itself, only one angel is even mentioned by name and that's Gabriel. Right. So this leads me into Christianity, right? Yep. So the story of Lucifer um, comes from the early Christian fathers, specifically St. Augustine. He was the only name <laughs> I can find that was associated with this. But the idea is they rejected the concept of the watchers, which we can do a whole podcast on the watchers. They are a group of fallen angels that came, you know, taught forbidden knowledge to humans, consorted with humans. Um, the archangels were heavily involved here. And that is a concept and belief system. Azazel is one of the most infamous watchers and I think leader of the watchers. Yes. Um, and he's known for teaching forbidden knowledge. There actually was. I love this story, a story of him teaching women like the art of makeup, right? The art of seduction and wearing a mask on your face. Ooh. I know. So obviously, if you're looking at Christianity, this is like completely evil. And what are these angels teaching people, et cetera? It depends on what you think evil is, right? Now, for Correct. me, I'm about that life. Show me the show me the forbidden knowledge. <laughs> show me how to do a good lip liner, man. <laughs> <laughs> show it to me. So um, the watchers can actually be found in the book of Dan. For those of you that are interested in looking that up, um, I did get the source on that. And so the early church fathers believed instead a story because a story is always good of this archangel that was so prideful. He opposed God and that's okay. what they wanted to go with instead. So they had, um, St. Augustine had scriptural authority over the book of Isaiah. So he was, you know, very heavily involved in the writing and what was being presented there. And obviously the mistranslation that we talked about in the beginning, um, they wanted yep. to take this story and run with it instead. I'm unsure why maybe it fit their narrative better. Maybe they didn't realize it was a mistranslation. Maybe they very much misunderstood the text. Unclear. It could be. Yeah. It depends on how, um, Aramaic Hebrew is being translated into Greek is being translated into another language um, and back and forth and back and forth. It's going to be a lot left into interpretation, which is why that Isaiah passage will often take out morning star and put Lucifer in. Right. So the, or the, basically the synopsis of the passage that 10 talked about, which was, um, how art thou fallen, fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which I can't even, which weaken the nations. I'm not even going to go into the rest of the passage. You can look it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically it refers to a legend and Christianity of the beautiful morning star who walked in Eden blazing in jewels and light. And his, in his insane pride as the son of dawn, um, they looked at him as defying, because being so bright, defying the sun, defying God. And he was so prideful, he wouldn't dim himself. That's what this, it is. That's where we got this from. This commentary from the early church fathers taking an epithet of Nebuchadnezzar yep. and, you know, these... Uh, ancient empires trying to attack kingdoms during you know the eighth century bc going into lucifer in eden and he's not going to dim himself in front of god yes so his name is lucifer when he's in heaven and then after his fall he becomes satan so then you you find him being referred to interchangeably with satan and the devil because he was an archangel right yes. um according to this one passage that's very vague it doesn't even doesn't even mention archangels. No, it, there's no mention of the word archangel in here. So you can really take this as you want. Yep. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking at the passage right now and I'm like, there is no nothing. Oh yeah. No. Mm -mm. So, um, you know, put my thinking cap on. It's like, you really can take this the way that you want it to. But after he is kicked out of heaven by that infamous story of Archangel Michael, um, he then becomes Satan and he becomes the king of hell. And then he's associated with the devil interesting so a celestial being in the greco-roman period has now turned into in christianity because of a mistranslation the devil evil lucifer satan yeah that all started with the hebrew word for shining bright 
it's just crazy. No, no, regardless <laughs> of what your belief system is, you know, I'm, I'm, I always like to look at biblical texts like this because yeah, it is part of some people's belief systems, but you have to often wonder where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? And like, I, I have so many questions. I still do. A hundred percent. And then it just even gets more confusing as we continue to travel through the timeline. And that was only one piece of Christianity. Um, and you know, I, like I said, I would love to do an episode on Satan because Satan is more prevalent in the Bible, but it's like, is Satan even an actual being or it's just a concept, you know, and people do believe both. Yeah. Cause I don't know. You know, in Paradise Lost, he is a character. So it's, I don't know. I don't feel don't like know either. Solved. <laughs> I mean, we talked a little bit about, um, I know this word's going to scare people, Satanism on Patreon, because I talked about how you can be theistic or you can also be atheist. You can believe yeah. in the being of Satan or you also are atheist where you don't believe in Satan and you actually just believe in being the adversary in your own life of going against basically traditional christian religion yeah so it's very interesting and it's so this is why maybe like i have a hard time understanding like society as a whole where it's like everyone is so afraid of things but if you ever just thought to kind of like do some research (laughs) and maybe question like i'm always questioning the things i believe in i'm like okay where is this coming from okay where is this based in Mm -hmm. um you know i never believed in this growing up so I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, it, it just begs to question of like, how, why, what was the point? How and why? Because, you know, revelation is first century. Okay. Mm-hmm. Lucifer is still not named as a fallen archangel. He's a dragon in that writing. St. Augustine comes around and that is what, 400, 430, something like that. Like, yeah. so we're still missing like a few hundred years. Right. And within those few hundred years, all of a sudden this like full backstory is coming out of where question mark, you know, just wanted to change it up. (laughs) I I mean, there's no, there's no other reasoning for it. I mean, it's a mistranslation. That's why I said this all starts with a mistranslation. Uh, Yeah. And it's not even like a close mistranslation. No, no, (laughs) but I think when we were talking earlier, what you mentioned about pride and hubris being like a thing, even in ancient times where it's like, it's always the downfall of mankind. It's always the downfall of a person when they're too prideful, when they have a huge ego and they can't put that aside. And I think it has a good, like, I don't want to sit here and entirely shit on it, but I think it has a good message almost on a basis. You're too prideful. You know what I mean? Like you can't be too prideful. And I think I, I definitely believe in that of, you know, be, be a little bit more humble in your work. Absolutely. I mean, you know, to the ancient Greeks, you know, a lot of their mythology has to do with pride and hubris and, you know, maintaining almost like a natural status quo. So that's why, you know, you see a lot of lessons within their mythology, especially, you know, um, Icarus, you know, going too close to the sun and his Mm -hmm. wings melting and him, you know, perishing, unfortunately. You have Prometheus. You have all of these adversaries in their own right trying to kind of pull a fast one over because of their pride. And some of them have to pay the ultimate price, sometimes eternally. But this concept of pride will be your downfall is basically kind of seen everywhere, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean- I mean, damn, look, I, the time of Isaiah, they were writing that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, his downfall was going to be pride. And it's like these kind of, these concepts becoming personified, it's utterly fascinating to see them develop into like a whole deep story with like lore and everything. It is. And then when you get to modern day, Lucifer does become pride personified, but we'll talk about that after. So let's continue on with our timeline. Where are we going okay, next? So- so we have, we just did St. Augustine. So that's mm-hmm. like 400. We're going to just round, keep nice round numbers. Um, St. Augustine, we're going to jump a hop, skip and a jump. We're going to the Victorian era. So 1899 this comes is where with it gets interesting. So All this interesting. When everything takes a wild, a wild U-turn. Like you think, you know, you think, you know, <laughs> and then you don't. So 
this is when um we have the gospel of aradia coming mm-hmm. out is 1899 mm-hmm. and you know some premise of who is writing it the author is leyland and he just for some historical background he hates the monarchy as a system he took part in the french revolution uh right before he wrote this and he hates the roman catholic church so this is his bias these are his stories this this is i don't mean to cut you <laughs> off but i always remembered this because there's a obviously this it's it's related to lucifer but i see people citing this as a source for lucifer all the time please this is why we say check your sources it has nothing to do with anything but go but we have to talk about it because he's mentioned in here okay so basically this source that he's writing is basically a gospel of a secret religion of witches and he is living in florence during this time right and if we've learned anything from chelsea on this podcast is that anyone in italy during this time period is not going to want to be called a witch you know or ever. Oh, and specifically the term stregonera or strega, which mm-hmm. means witch in Italian. I always say this if you would have called my Aunt Jean a strega, she would have bopped you over the head so fast because it is the utmost insult. And I am Toscani, so I'm very interested in this. And the creation of this story is it's it's almost like legendary and like mythical on its own. He meets this woman and she tells him that she knows all of this kind of like secret magic and that she inherited a lot of these tools for divination and magic and fortune telling. So a folk practice, would you say? That's what I got from it. So a folk practice. (laughs) And that um, he kept kind of pestering this woman to like, for her to like show him everything. And then on New Year's Day in 1897, She hands him a manuscript, which he prints for the first time in the Aradia work. And she hand wrote everything. And it was compiled from oral traditions. So from storytelling. Um, And he's not really clear on how she got any of this information because all of a sudden, as soon as she gives it to him, she just kind of disappears. Right. I was going to say, is anyone else backing this up? Because obviously no. a lot of folk practice is through oral tradition. A lot of it's Correct. been lost, but you usually so usually have a lot of other people in the area doing the same thing, just in a different way. Well, that's the whole thing. After this writing comes out in 1899, no other Italian or European folklorist has ever kind of you know, delve deeper commented on like whether this is true or anything like this just exists and no fact so this story and compilation of writings opens up with a myth and it describes how diana now everybody diana is the roman goddess of the hunt who is the twin Mm -hmm. sister of apollo describes how diana a goddess of darkness mated with her brother lucifer the god of light after his expulsion from paradise so the garden and gave birth to aradia and when she was grown diana sent her to earth to teach witchcraft and poison to the commoners who had become bandits in the mountains rather than suffer the oppression of the feudal lords so basically like a social commentary Mm -hmm. on hierarchical struggles right and how they could use these magic poisoning techniques against their oppressors. And it goes on and it talks about, you know, the followers of Aradia and Diana would meet naked in a wild place at each full moon to adore the goddess Diana, the goddess of witches. Very, very interesting. It goes in a little bit more. And, you know, it really talks about how this author just kind of superimposes this goddess in. He claims she's a Semitic goddess, doesn't back it up, doesn't comment on how she just boop, ended up in Tuscany, nothing. It almost reads as like, this came to me in a dream and that is not a source. That is not a citation. That is not anything. 
Yeah. And there was like no one that was able to back this up. So it's very interesting. We have to talk about it because Lucifer is mentioned in it. But Mm -hmm. also, this is why you need to be aware of the sources that you're reading from and really diving. Perfect example of diving into an author. Yeah. And in the later part of the writing, he persists and asserts that there is still this secret society or sect of witches that, you know, there are entire villages of these women who are doing these things, but nothing is cited, almost hearsay, and was the woman who, quote unquote, gave him this kind of writings of oral traditions, was she even real? That's true. Also, if it's such a secret society of women, why are they handing a manuscript to a man? On New Year's Day. I have no idea. That's what I'm saying. Like, I believe, yeah, there are, like I said, there are secret Italian traditions. Of course, it's called folk magic folk yeah. practice, but it's coming from somewhere. Like a lot of my folk practice to talk about on this podcast comes from a lot of Mediterranean practices that already existed before it even happened. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, I bet you, if you took me and a Greek folk practitioner, we'd be doing an evil eye working the same way. About the same way. About the same way. Almost identical. Um, So the fact that no one else could back this up and it's like, yeah, why would this random witch give this random man? (laughs) And he also called her a fortune teller. So like that was another thing. He also called her a a strega. So, you know, there's that. Um, With it, though, it is interesting that um, he was, you know, writing about Diana as a dark goddess, which maybe came from the fact that diana as a roman goddess is associated with the night with mo- the moon and it's giving good and evil you know what i mean light and dark lucifer the light being and diana the dark goddess they get together and they have a witch <laughs> but That's also like when you were saying it to me i no, but it's very fitting because i mean diana's brother is apollo whose epithet of phobos is bright is light so right was lucifer in this case based on apollo i have no idea i don't know but it it leaves a lot of questions and also with this um book aradia gospel of witches it did spin off into other practices as well especially wicca so people are pulling from this and incorporating it in their own spiritual practices this is why you got to research what we're practicing here all right you just can't just pick something up off the internet and be like okay this is correct we have to do the research and um I think it's interesting because then this leads us into modern day, right? Correct. Yeah. We're, we're rounding it out with modern day. So modern day. Yes. We have demonolatry now. Okay. Now I would love to do a whole episode, um, probably for Patreon. We're going to dive more into like the more taboo spiritual practices and topics, especially demons and how they're being viewed today. But demonolatry in its most basic form is the study and veneration of demons. So at this point in time, Lucifer, after Christianity, after all of this, is considered Satan, the devil, the king of hell, right? He's a fallen angel and he makes a name for himself in hell now and that's where he rules. So demonolatry with Lucifer specifically is being based off this concept. Um, And a lot of people that practice within demonolatry are venerating fallen angels, these adversary-like figures, Satan in the Bible and other belief systems to reject the concept of Christianity. Um, There's also a belief that demons are teachers and mentors. Um, We will one day go into the Lesser Keys of Solomon, talk about the Goetia. There's so much, like you can research these topics um, of how people, you know, would call upon demons for information, make packs, et cetera. But now Lucifer is regarded as the fallen angel. Yes. In demonolatry. You can find him in personal grimoires. Um, his sigil, which I'm wearing around my neck for those of you on YouTube. Um, this is a sigil of liberation. He now has a sigil associated with him, which never had before. This stands for knowledge, truth, and liberation. Um, people are venerating him as a yep. god. He yep. turns into a god now. He's a god. Calling upon him as a teacher and a mentor. And like I said, he's now taken himself as the god of knowledge liberation and light he is better known as an infernal king and he Uh also rules over the seven deadly sins and is the personification of pride yes because of his story so now he's evolved into a god so lucifer went through apotheosis then 
Well, this well, leads to my uh, point of yes, I guess if you did listen to our last apotheosis episode, yes, he went from celestial being to God. Um had his well, own quote unquote death, right? Through the falling angel aspect. Yeah, here's my question now. Like he started as just a celestial event. I don't even know if he was like a a being. No, you know? he was just an event happening in the sky. An event, um, a concept, if you will, a concept that became personified. And this personified concept thus went through apotheosis and became a god. Yes. And now he has his whole, he's one of the most venerated in modern day. So when you hear people are venerating Lucifer, they are venerating his king of hell, infernal king aspect, which doesn't make people innately evil. People are studying and learning from him as the light bringer, the God of knowledge, the God of truth. They're, they're being Satan's themselves where they're opposing traditional religion to liberate themselves and to be what they want to be. That is what that means. And we talked about his belief. He has a belief system. You don't even have yeah. to believe in Lucifer as a being, but he has this belief system that many people follow called Luciferianism, which we talked about on Patreon last week. Yeah. So damn. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting tall tale and story. And these are once again, just the facts of the situation. Um, yeah. when you do fo- when you do look into demonology, it is a lot of personal gnosis and grimoires. So you know, we do have some historical basis for it, but um, once again, that will have to be another episode of where is this coming from? <laughs> Sticks and bones. Where can we find this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you do have people that are venerating fallen angels like Azazel, like I mentioned in The Watchers. Yeah. To uh, call upon him for learning for a bit of knowledge. So people today are really rejecting the concept of the church and traditional religion in general. That's utterly fascinating it is it is so i but i think it speaks to like the time i don't think people are at least where i live i don't want to categorize the whole world um going to church every sunday like they used to no i i wouldn't say that either plus i think with you know popular like video games you know with you know covid and everything people kind of turning to the internet or just like getting back into gaming and all of that we do see like an absolute rise in like demonology games like can mm-hmm. you guess what demon is haunting this place yeah or one of my personal favorites watching some favorite streamers of mine playing the game devour which focuses on different maps focusing on the watchers and the cult of azazel so it That's is interesting cool. how it's becoming more kind of modernized in media today and i mean with devour that game the kind of gist of it is you know something went wrong because these people were trying to control the demon so that's a lesson for you right there would you say like the lesser keys of solomon (laughs) i would and i don't think anybody learned a thing or two from that so they're like yeah i'll I'll summon azazel and then things go bad (laughs) i know um i think people get totally freaked out like when you know i say like i study all practices and things don't forget everybody i also like to do paranormal investigations you think i haven't encountered a demon i've talked about it i need Mm -hmm. to know what the hell i'm walking into and um i don't think it's weird or taboo to study topics like this because something's mistranslated and something's up and we need to get to the bottom of it yeah yeah i want to even look further like where from 90 something ce to like 400 ce where did all of these conversations about Lucifer as a fallen angel and basically the dichotomy of where is the core foundation of good and evil coming from? I don't know. It's, it's, and I don't know if we'll ever truly know. And maybe this needs to be another part series, but like I said, I would like to dive into the origins of the devil and like, where did that come from? How did the Jews not believe in the concept of the devil? But then when you get to Christianity, it's all of a sudden a thing. I mean, they they do mention um, uh, demons by name in some of their religious texts. So yeah. we do know that there's adversaries or those who go against Yahweh. But is it kind of the same thing? I don't know. I don't know. It just leaves us with more questions. But ones that hopefully <laughs> we can probably 75% look into. I mean, there's just so much that goes into this. Like, I don't even think we really scratch the surface. 
because we're missing a lot of time periods. It's like, you know, how much research can you do for one podcast episode? I mean, if we want to look at the middle eight, what is it? Renaissance, Baroque period. It's something. Don't quote me on, I want to say it's like 1500s, maybe 1600s, but there's a story in art history. That's one of my favorites that the church hired an artist. I love this. I was hoping you'd bring this up. This is my favorite. (laughs) Um, The church hired, um, an artist. I'm actually going to pull it up so that I can, you know, get my names and my dates right. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean, like, we barely scratched the surface of Aradia. Like, is this the only text that she comes up in? Like, she's not a Roman god. I don't know. And I've seen people talking about Aradia before. And when I went to go do the research, um, this was the only thing that I personally found. So, like I said, we would need to do more research into Aradia, but I... I wanted to talk about it today because Lucifer is mentioned in that text. And it's like, how did he get here? <laughs> You're mentioning him by name. <laughs> it's all very interesting. But um, do you have anything else you want to add? Yes. Are you still okay. looking up? Oh, you looking up this guy's name. Yes. So basically, the gist of it is the church commissioned an artist to create um lucifer lucifer as a fallen angel in this sense and i'll post pictures of this because man these brothers <laughs> it was good um so the first brother turns in his piece right he's like here you go church i've done it here's your lucifer right this image of lucifer he is sitting um solemn on a rock he's got wings out they look very much like bat wings and there's a snake at the bottom and he is just kind of looking down thinking the church goes well this is too hot we cannot have this in church because too sexy too sexy for jesus we the cannot have this faint. we cannot have this where there are going to be women when we are you know talking about the gospels and everything we cannot have this he is a fallen angel he is eva we yes. cannot have this in my house so they uh commission another statue and <laughs> they chose his brother to do it come from a family of artists and he creates an even dare i say hotter version of a fallen angel we're here for it we're here for it fallen angels for the girls in this one he is same sort of bat wings very same pose snake around him he is chained to a rock he has a crown in his hand and he is just posing and it's absolutely like, um, what is, what is going on here? But that is one of my favorite stories in our history that the church yeah. tried to get a statue of Lucifer and then said it was too hot. So the other brother made an even hotter version. So shout out to those brothers. Yeah. We'll have to post that on the Instagram. <laughs> but, um, anyway, we hope you really enjoyed today's episode. Um, Ted and I did so much research into this and it was so fun. Um, yeah, a few housekeeping items. Just remember, we do not answer our DMs. I get DMs a lot. I just want to say it for the people maybe you didn't know. Email us if you have a question concerning a reading, a product in the store. If you have a question concerning a business inquiry, Ten and I both have separate business email addresses in our social accounts. Or you can yes. email the business email address. Uh, Mystery Boxes launched, uh, what did I say, the 13th? 15th. 15th? Jeez. 15th the full <laughs> halloween line launches the 21st and then we also have another mini launch of some of that darker store stuff happening on the 28th we will not be restocking mystery box- boxes i just want to make that very clear so 12 p.m eastern time mystery boxes are going we don't have a whole ton um Mm-mm. so set your alarms we will remind you and we will be doing sneak previews that week of all of the stuff that will be incorporated in your mystery box with a little mini channeled reading Our readings are open for September. If you want to book with us, you can book in our bio. We will never message you. Please beware of scam artists out there. I'm really going on my my housekeeping items, but it's just all the questions I keep getting. You need to. Yeah, we will never message you for a reading. We run a very legitimate business with a beautiful booking website that, you know, we work so hard on. So go take a look. Um, (laughs) Please do not send anybody in your DMs money. Oh my God, please, please stop getting scammed, guys. Bye. Someone sent someone $300 the other day. I'm like, my readings don't even cost that much. 
And if somebody's Please. asking you if you want a birth chart or astrology reading from either of us, run. It is not us. It is Felsi and Fen trying to make a quick buck off of you. Yes. Look at the usernames, the usernames that add a double letter. There's another one running out there that has two T's in theirs versus mine. They're getting smarter. They have like 10K yeah. followers now. Okay. So be aware of the scammers. No yes. legitimate practitioner is going to email you or DM you and ask you if you need a reading or an aura cleanse or that you're cursed. We're just not walking around doing that to people. I don't have time. <laughs> yeah, quite honestly, I don't have time. I don't have the time. That. So um, just wanted to do that quick PSA. We're very excited for the Halloween launch. Thank you again for all your support. Don't forget to like, subscribe, rate our podcast in the store. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to see us on video. Share it with a friend, a loved one. This is great dinner conversation for uh, Christmas coming up. Send them this episode. (laughs) And we'll see you next time on Sticks and Bones with Chelsea and 10. Bye, everybody. Bye.